Greetings, this is Greg. The development and introduction of the Bell P39 Aracobra suffered from less than ideal timing. Like the Lockheed P38 Lightning, it was just a little too early to benefit fully from the aerodynamic discoveries from NACA that benefited later designs like the Chance Vought Corsair, the Republic P47 Thunderbolt, or North America's P51 Mustang. It was also a little too early to take advantage of the dual stage mechanically driven supercharging systems and effective intercooling systems that would benefit the later airplanes. In spite of this, it did have some pretty high levels of success in certain theaters of World War II, but this video is about the design of the plane, so let's get into that. The plane was designed initially to meet specifications from a proposal called X609 issued by the U.S. Army Air Corps in February of 1937. Of course, in 1937, nobody really knew what air warfare would look like in 1942. They had some ideas based on action seen in the Spanish Civil War, which was ongoing at the time. And of course, in July of 1937, we started to see the results of air warfare in the Second Sino-Japanese War, which could even be argued as the beginnings of World War II, at least in the Pacific. The X-609 proposal called for a fast, high-altitude fighter, essentially an interceptor, something that could effectively attack incoming high-altitude, high-speed bombers. At the time, the U.S. Army Air Corps was pretty much married to the idea of turbocharging, more correctly called turbo supercharging, but I'll call it turbocharging to be in harmony with the parlance of our time. This love of turbocharging seems to have stemmed from this 1932 NACA report, which compared various methods of forced induction. I've reviewed this report in detail in this video, which I suggest you watch, but for now I'll just give you a quick summary. NACA determined that turbocharging, meaning driving a compressor with exhaust gases, was superior to mechanically driven superchargers in several ways. It resulted in more power and especially more power above 20,000 feet. As the U.S. Army Air Corps and later U.S. Army Air Force was really pushing a bomber doctrine at the time, they wanted fast high altitude bombers and the turbocharger was thought to be the answer. I suppose in a way it was the answer. The B-17 Flying Fortress, B-24 Liberator, B-29 Super Fortress, and the B-32 Dominator were all turbocharged and all had pretty good performance at high altitude. However, the NACA report also made it clear that due to the simplicity and compact nature of the gear-driven superchargers, they might be the way to go for certain applications. The U.S. Navy latched onto this and generally shunned the turbos in favor of mechanical superchargers. So in terms of fighter development, the U.S. Army Air Force and the U.S. Navy were going in different directions with regards to supercharging. Generally speaking, fighters designed for the U.S. Army Air Corps, later U.S. Army Air Force, were turbocharged. These include the P-43 Lancer, the P-38 Lightning, and the P-47 Thunderbolt. The P-51 Mustang did not have a turbocharger, but it was initially developed for the British and not specifically to meet a U.S. Army Air Force specification. The P-40 Warhawk is another exception. It does not have a turbo. That's not because Curtis didn't try for it. They were developing the XP-37, which was quite similar to the P-40, but the XP-37 had a turbocharger. It took up a lot of room behind the engine, so they had to move the cockpit way back. This plane didn't work out, so they went with the P-40 instead, which was being developed simultaneously. In other words, we got the P-40 because turbocharging was still relatively new, especially in fighters, and the turbocharged fighter from Curtis just didn't work out, so they went with plan B. All this brings us to the Bell P-39. It was intended to be a turbocharged fighter with very strong high altitude performance. The XP-39 first flew in April of 1938, and it had a turbocharger. Its performance was decent. It could reach 390 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, which was quite fast at the time. The problem was this was the prototype version of the airplane, and it was 2,000 pounds lighter than the project projected production versions due to a lack of self-sealing tanks and armament. This meant that the plane once in production would not have been as fast as it needed to be because 
Although the engine put out good power at altitude, the plane's drag turned out to be much higher than anticipated. Around this time, Hap Arnold, head of the Air Force, decided that NACA should take a look at the aerodynamics of several current military airplanes, the P-39 included, and see what improvements they could come up with. The testing resulted in this NACA report, which was very influential in U.S. aircraft design. They worked out aerodynamic improvements, reducing drag for a number of airplanes and in all sorts of areas, engine cooling, weapon installations, gun sights, and more. If you read the report and then look at a plane like an early P-40 and then look at a P-51A or a Corsair, you can see the report's influence. I'll put this NACA report in the Patreon section so you can read through it if interested. In this video, we're only concerned with it as it pertains to the P-39, so I'll cover those specifics briefly. I should mention that although the report wasn't published until October of 1940, the actual work on it began in mid-39. Bell and other manufacturers had access to the information coming out of NACA, and some of this was applied to the XP-39 in an effort to improve it. NACA determined that the turbocharged XP-39 had very high drag. The only planes in the test that had higher coefficients of drag were the Brewster Buffalo, Brewster Buccaneer, and a Grumman biplane. That's really bad. Anytime your new fighter, especially a fighter with an inline uh, liquid-cooled B-12, anytime that has drag coefficient numbers in the same league as radial engine planes from Brewster, not a manufacturer known for building slippery airplanes, let alone uh, drag coefficient numbers in the same league as a biplane. When that happens, you know things have gone sideways. So where was all this drag coming from? Well, a lot of it was coming from the turbo supercharging system, which did, by the way, include an intercooler. There were cooling ducts for the exhaust pipes, plus intercooler ducting, and most significantly, drag was coming from the turbo itself. In this picture, you can see the turbo under the airplane. It's exposed to the airstream, largely for cooling, but that results in a ton of drag. At the time the P-39 was designed, turbocharging was pretty new in airplanes, so we can give Bell a pass for overlooking this. It was normal to expose the turbo itself, and the hot exhaust ducting to the airflow uh, for cooling purposes was normally exposed as well. You'll see this same sort of exposed design on the B-17 Flying Fortress, the B-24 Liberator, and the P-38 Lightning, as well as most Axis attempts at turbocharging airplanes. In the cases of the bombers, they tended to fly at high altitudes, and although they were going pretty fast up there, they were at lower indicated airspeeds, thus the parasite drag from uh, the turbo installation wasn't as big of a problem. However, for fighters, it was a big problem. NACA determined that this drag had to be eliminated, and they came up with a way to do it, which was incorporated into future turbocharged planes like the P-47 Thunderbolt. The XP-39 also had a lot of drag from its landing gear. The main wheels didn't retract fully. That sounds strange today, but it was not unusual at the time. But NACA found it added a lot of drag. They made alterations so that the gear would retract fully, which helped the drag, but it was still too high, so they enclosed, they in, installed very close-fitting gear doors, and that sealed everything up and solved that issue. They also did work cleaning up the plane's cooling system. Now, Bell incorporated most of these improvements, including the improvements to the cooling system and the landing gear, into the production P-39s. However, they didn't in, include the improvements to the turbo installation. Instead of fixing it, Bell simply deleted the whole turbo supercharging system. Nobody around today knows for sure why this was done. There are various theories, but none have really solid evidence, so I can't say which are correct. I'll go through them all and you can take your best guess. First, there may have been political forces at work causing potential turbocharger supply problems for Bell. If that's true, then it could be that rather than try to fight that battle, they just went in another direction. Another possibility is that they thought that by eliminating the turbo and cleaning up the airplane aerodynamically, that its performance would be good enough and at a low enough price point that it would be an attract attractive option for the U.S. Army Air Corps and other customers, and I do think that was a part of it. I've also heard that Bell Aircraft was short on cash and needed to get the plane done. Eliminating the turbo and cleaning up the airplane 
was the quickest way to get them up for sale and get cash flowing. In any case, once the decision had been made to eliminate the turbo, they moved forward with the Allison V12 with a single stage, single speed, gear driven supercharger. It worked well enough at low altitudes, but couldn't put out much power at high altitude. At that point, Bell engineers rarely mentioned the turbo, and they never really gave a reason that they eliminated it. I need to be clear that the plane still retained its gear-driven supercharger, just not the turbocharger. It's not unusual to hear claims that the P-39 didn't have a supercharger at all. That's the result of confusion over the terminology. The turbo supercharger was deleted, but the plane still retained its gear-driven supercharger, non-intercooled, and that supercharger was built into the back of the Allison V-12. Bell Engineers wrote a number of articles in period publications about the airplane's design. So let's take a look at one published in this March of 1940 magazine and written by Robert J. Woods, who was chief engineer for Bell Aircraft at the time. Before we open it up, I want to point out that I have put all these magazines that I use in this video in PDF form into the Patreon section at various tier levels, so if you want to read them in their entirety, you could do that. In this article by Robert J. Woods, he never mentions the turbocharger. It had been eliminated by this point. He spends a lot of time explaining the engine location, which, as I'm sure you know, is behind the cockpit, which was, which is pretty normal for fighter planes today. Uh, think F-15 Eagle or MiG-29 Fulcrum, but it was very unusual back in the 1930s. Bell engineers referred to the engine location as the middle of the fuselage. I'll call it mid-engine for simplicity. Years ago, I had read and accepted the idea that the P-39's unusual engine location was to make room for its big 37mm cannon. It turns out that theory doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. The big cannon was a factor, but it's not the main reason for the engine's location. Robert Woods says in the article, quote, the installation of the engine near the middle of the fuselage and the use of an extension drive shaft to drive the propeller permit realization of aerodynamic improvements not heretofore practical." Unquote. He goes on to say that without an engine in the nose, the nose shape could be more ideal for low drag, and he also points out that with the mass of the engine near the center of the plane, the polar moment of inertia would be reduced as all that mass is closer to the center of gravity. You may remember from previous videos that an airplane will pitch about its lateral axis, which runs through the center of gravity, as do all three axes. Keeping all the weight close to that point makes the plane more responsive in pitch because of the low polar moment of inertia. The article also points out that the pilot is closer to the center of gravity in this installation and thus is more able to withstand the strain of abrupt maneuvers. I suppose that's true. It won't matter in terms of G loading in a sustained turn, but in an abrupt transitional motion it's true. I just doubt it's very significant. I'm not a fighter pilot, but just looking at modern fighters, it seems this is something modern designers don't really put much thought into so I don't think it's a big deal. However, if you are a fighter pilot and you want to add your thoughts to the comments section, please feel free to do so. In other words, do you think that it will reduce stress on the pilot by having the cockpit farther from the center of gravity? Um, I think the effect is minor, but I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. He also explains that this engine location improves visibility because the nose doesn't need to be as big. With the engine behind the pilot, it's only blocking visibility to an area that's blocked anyway in a conventional single-engine fighter. Thus, visibility forward and down is improved, which matters for weapons employment. The article mentions some of the low-drag improvements from NACA, including the radiator and oil cooler ducting. Now, it seems that people were skeptical about the P-39's engine location. It was, after all, pretty unusual. In any case, one year later, in March of 1941, um, in that issue of this magazine, Robert J. Woods wrote another article, which, as you can see in the title, very clearly and directly addresses engine location concerns. He hits very hard on the aerodynamic advantages of the Aracobra's engine position. In fact, the way I read it, he goes so far as to say that this was the next step in aircraft evolution. He may have been right. We never found out because of jet airplanes. Uh, but he points out that in the recent past, 
meaning up until the late 1920s and a bit beyond, airplanes used engines that were literally uncovered. Improvements did come along like the Townsend Ring, which was a British development by a Dr. Townsend. The Townsend Ring reduced drag and improved cooling. You can see it here on this Boeing P-26 surrounding the engine. These stayed around for a while, even into World War II, as seen on these swordfish torpedo bombers. But NACA had other ideas, and they created a cowling. There was a period in which serious debates took place over the merits of the Townsend Ring versus the NACA cowling. You'll see both on different types of airplanes built in the 1930s. The German Ju-52 actually uses both designs on one airplane, NACA cowlings on the wing-mounted engines and the Townsend Ring on the fuselage engine. Uh, ultimately, the NACA cowlings won out. Now, of course, the liquid-cooled V-12s started to come on strong in the 1930s, and they had less frontal area than the air-cooled engines. However, as Robert J. Woods points out in his article, the liquid-cooled V-12s um, is still going to be the biggest, heaviest component in the airplane. Furthermore, it's surrounded by engine-driven accessories, and putting up front makes it more difficult to streamline the nose of the airplane. He then discusses the need for weapons in the nose. Fitting a 37 millimeter cannon on this plane with the engine up front would have been a problem. I'm not saying it would have been impossible, but the best solution was to have it firing through the spinner. And to do that, either the prop has to be offset far enough from the crankshaft to get the barrel past the engine, typically down the center of the V like the Germans did in the uh, BF-109, or move the engine. As they already wanted to move the engine for aerodynamic reasons, that made more sense. The article continues in a sort of part two in next month's edition for April of 1941, and yes, these are all in the Patreon section. This article talks about the tricycle landing gear, which was unusual for a fighter at the time. It became commonplace later, of course. Tricycle gear makes takeoff and landings much easier and safer. At the time, a lot of fighters were being lost in takeoff and landing accidents. Some pilots were killed in those accidents, and during World War II, airframe and pilot attrition due to accidents was no small factor. It was a, actually a really big deal, and reducing it helped to maintain strength of numbers. At the time of the P-39's introduction, I don't think there had ever been a combat plane with tricycle landing gear in which the nose wheel retracted into an engine compartment. In other words, yes, there were tricycle gear warplanes. Uh, think of the P-38, for example, that came around around the same time. But like the P-38, these were usually twin-engine planes, which left space in the nose for gear retraction. So this was another reason to move the engine. If the engine was up front, I don't think it could have had tricycle gear. And if it did, it wouldn't have had room for the weapons up there. So this all ties together. I should mention there was a single Bell Era Bonita aircraft built, which is seen here. Looks like an Aracobra, and it more or less is an Aracobra, but without tricycle gear. The Era Bonita was in parallel development with the Aracobra. It was designed to go after the naval market and had conventional tail dragging landing gear. This plane never went anywhere for a number of reasons. Of course, there are many civilian tract retractable gear uh, tricycle airplanes with engines up front, like the Cessna 210, but they don't have guns. If you have an engine in the nose, you start to run out of room for these things pretty fast. I can't think of many airplanes with a front-mounted engine, fuselage-mounted weapons, and tricycle gear. There are some. The Dornier 335 comes to mind, but its nose wheel doesn't retract into the engine compartment. They had another option because the plane itself was so big, and in any case, that's a much later airplane. So the engine location was not all about weapons placement. It was done, according to the designer, primarily for aerodynamic reasons, and the weapons configuration was secondary, and the tricycle gear is specifically mentioned as a factor, and it clearly factored in pretty heavily as well. Now, although it's not mentioned in the article written by the designer, I think a big reason the mid-engine location was chosen was because it made it easier to fit the turbo system in there. That's not mentioned in any of the primary source documents I have, but just looking at the various turbocharged fighters that were built, I think it's pretty obvious. The other option was a front engine and a rearward cockpit, as in the failed effort by Curtis. 
Another way to do this was to make the fuselage really fat, which is what Republic did in their turbocharged fighters. Or you could just build a really big twin engine fighter, which is what Lockheed did. Bell's solution may have been the most elegant turbo installation in a fighter had they finished it. But as we know, that's not what happened. And by the time these articles were written, that ship has sailed. So there would be no advantage in mentioning it when trying to sell airplanes. We need to keep in mind that these articles, while they are primary source documents, and they were written by people closely involved in the design of the aircraft, and I'm sure they're technically accurate. However, they were ultimately intended to sway opinion and get the public and military officials on board with the idea of buying P-39s, saying that they put the engine in the middle to help with the turbo installation that they then deleted probably wouldn't help sell airplanes, so the articles focused on the other advantages of the design. It's clear that the mid-engine design had some advantages. Aerodynamics, firepower, ease of installing the tricycle gear, and also maintenance. Mechanics could work on the engine from the wing, and even engine removal was relatively easy because the armament wasn't in the way and didn't have to be removed before you pulled out the engine. Now, what about drawbacks? Well, there are always drawbacks. In order to drive the propeller, they had to run a drive shaft from the engine to a gear reduction unit, which then drove the propeller. It's a two-piece drive shaft with a center bearing. It's much like what you would find under a lot of rear-wheel drive front-engine European cars. Drive shafts were well understood at this point in time, and the drive shaft itself did not present too much of an engineering challenge. Now, I'm not trivializing it. I'm not saying I could design a drive shaft. I'm just saying that making a drive shaft that could spin at 3,000 RPM and transmit that much torque just wasn't that far out of the ordinary at the time. In fact, Bell had already done something quite similar on their Aracuda. What was out of the ordinary, at least for an airplane, was designing the fuselage so it wouldn't get all twisted up by the power. You see, in a normal airplane, let's use this P-40 as an example, the engine puts a force on the propeller, actually on the reduction gear, but to keep this simple, let's just pretend it's direct drive and the crankshaft is directly driving the prop. When the prop moves in one direction, let's say clockwise as viewed from the rear, it tries to move the engine in the other direction. Of course, it can't do that because the engine is attached to a very strong firewall via very strong engine mounts. So what it actually tends to do is roll the whole airplane to the left. When you go to full power, it will try to roll the airplane to the left, and at low speeds when the flight controls are the least effective, this can sometimes lead to a pretty wild ride. The point is that the aircraft's structure has to be able to withstand that tremendous twisting force, a force strong enough to actually roll the whole airplane. And in a P-40, it's not a big deal to do that. The engine itself isn't going to break. Like all aircraft engines, it's designed to handle the stress from its own power output. And the aircraft manufacturer makes the firewall, motor mounts, and other structures strong enough to handle it. But what about in the P-39? Think about how this twisting force works here. That reduction gear, which in the P-40 would normally be bolted directly to the front of the engine, is now, in the P-39, about 10 feet forward. That means that about 10 feet of fuselage needs to be strong enough to withstand that very strong twisting force. Furthermore, it needs to not only withstand that force, it needs to do it through a wide range of G-loadings as the plane maneuvers and do it while containing a drive shaft that's spinning at 3,000 RPM, and you want to keep that drive shaft in alignment. Now, the drive shaft did have a flexible joint at each end, kind of like a U-joint, but you know, you still want it to stay as straight as possible. So the fuselage had to be quite strong to, to resist this twisting motion. All this results in a weight penalty for the mid-engine design. The drive shaft itself doesn't weigh too much, but it all adds up, and the extra strengthening between the engine and propeller add even more weight. Surprisingly, the P-39 isn't all that heavy, though. It's just heavier than it would have been um, with a conventional design. That's a real testament to the engineers at Bell. Even with the extra weight from the mid-engine design plus the tricycle gear and the 37 millimeter cannon, its empty weight is about the same as that of a P-40E. As seen in this manual, the P-39L's empty weight is actually lower than the P-40E. Not much, but it's lower. There are examples where the P-39 is heavier 
Uh, but in most cases, these two planes are about within about 150 pounds of each other. And which one's heavier kind of depends on which version you're, you're comparing. Now, to get an idea of the main problem with the mid-engine configuration, let's take a look at this cutaway drawing. This is a very early model, a P39C, of which only 20 were built. I doubt any C models ever saw combat, but it happens to be a really nice drawing which suits my purposes. Now where would you put a fuselage fuel tank? I know it has tanks in the wings, I'll come back to that. There just isn't anywhere in the fuselage you can put a fuel tank. The nose section is taken up by weapons and that retractable nose wheel. It looks like you might be able to put a tank under the cockpit, but that's just because of the way the drawing is made. You really can't. That space is taken up by flight and cooling system control mechanisms, along with the motor for the retractable landing gear and a lot of its associated mechanism, and some of the flap mechanisms in there as well. There's just no room left over there for a fuel tank. Now, aft of the cockpit, you have the engine. The space below the engine is taken up by oil and coolant radiators. Behind the engine, there's some room there, but fuel's heavy. Putting a tank back there would create a center of gravity issue, even if the tank was empty, because self-sealing tanks are pretty heavy. Thus, the only place they could put the fuel was in the wings, which is what you see in this drawing. And as you can see, the P39C has a total fuel capacity of 170 gallons, which isn't too bad. That's more than a P40, and it's a lot more than a contemporary Spitfire or BF-109. The problem is, those are not self-sealing tanks. This is a very earlier version of the plane, lacking both self-sealing tanks and armor plate. Self-sealing tanks are heavy, and they have thick walls. The ex extra thickness steals room from the inside of the tank because they can't increase the external dimensions and still fit them in the same locations. This is especially problematic for wing tanks because there just isn't a lot of depth there to work with in the vertical direction in the first place because the wings aren't that thick. So when they added self-sealing tanks to the P39, they went with a series of interconnected cells as you can see here. Now this was great for resisting battle damage, but it reduced the fuel capacity from 170 to 120 gallons, which was quite low by US fighter standards still slightly more than a Spitfire or 109, but really not enough for anything in the Pacific theater or much of anything else uh, that the US would be involved in. Even the P-40, a plane not exactly known for its range, which had about the same engine, carried 148 to 158 gallons of internal fuel, depending on the variant. There really wasn't any way to solve this problem in the P-39. Drop tanks could extend the range, but it just wasn't a total solution. There are a few more things I want to discuss in terms of problems with the mid-engine design. More correctly, I think some of these were perceived problems, not actual problems. It was thought uh, by some that the mid-engine would cause the plane to have a center of gravity so far aft it would be unstable or difficult or impossible to recover from a stall or spin. That's just not true, so let's get into it. We all know that our three control axes run through the plane center of gravity. I know I'm burning through this, but I've covered it in other videos, so it's a quick review. If you're new here, you can pause and read if needed. The center of gravity, or CG, is located forward of the center of lift in almost all airplanes. Some modern fighters, like the F-16, are different, but this is how 99% of airplanes built are set up. If the CG is too far aft, it will become unstable and if the plane stalls, it may be difficult or impossible to recover. So the next question is, does the P-39's mid-engine configuration result in a CG so far aft it's a problem? The answer is no, but I want to approach this question from a few angles. Sometimes when you're trying to figure something out, it's best to just take a step back and look at the picture, look at the airplane in this case. There isn't really a need to overthink this. The plane is, this plane in the picture is actually a P400, more or less a P39, but these often had 20 millimeter cannons instead of the big 37. So yes, the engine is mounted aft to the cockpit, but is it really that far back? It's more or less over the center of the wing and almost everything else that has significant weight is forward of the engine, the cockpit, fuel tanks, armor, and weapons. As we look at the plane, do we know exactly where the CG is? Well, no, not exactly. But we do know that even without a pilot, fuel, or ammunition, all things that bring it farther forward, 
the CG still has to be forward of the main landing gear, and that's around the center of the wing. We know it can't be aft of that point, or the plane would fall on its tail when parked. So just by looking at the airplane, we know that its CG can't be all that far aft. Of course, in modern times, it's not unusual at all to have an engine or engines mounted really far back on the airplane. That alone doesn't mean the plane will be tail heavy. A lot of other factors go into this. But at the time the Era Cobra was introduced, um, these mid or aft mounted engines were still pretty unusual, so they caused some undue skepticism. Now we also know that when an airplane has its CG too far aft, it becomes unstable and stall recovery becomes difficult or impossible. There are many test reports for the P-39 that show that it was stable and that stall recovery was conventional and could be done with no real issues. It did have a fairly aggressive or sudden stall, but that has more to do with the wing design than anything else. The Focke Wolf FW-190 was much the same way. However, in the P-39, the stall was very controllable. In fact, even the ailerons remained functional pretty far into the stall because the wingtips were washed out, which means they had a lower angle of attack than the inboard section of the wing. In other words, the wing had some twist built into it for this purpose. So according to the flight test information, as well as what we can see just by looking at the airplane, the P-39 CG was pretty normal. Let's get more specific and compare the P-39's CG location to that of other World War II fighters. Typically in World War II fighters, and even today in lighter airplanes, pilots determine center of gravity uh, in inches or millimeters of some other dis measurement of distance um, aft of some reference point, usually called the datum. In other words, your center of gravity might be 134 inches aft of the datum, or whatever the distance is. So you might know that your allowable range is from 110 inches aft of the datum for a maximum forward CG to 140 inches uh, for a maximum aft limit, or whatever it happens to be. And as long as your CG falls in that range, you're good. This works well and is easy to calculate, and is, that's, that's how center of gravity was calculated uh, by pilots of fighters in World War II, and it's still today how it's calculated um, in most light airplanes. However, for comparison purposes, it's not all that useful because that datum or reference point could be any point in the airplane or even outside of the airplane. It could be the firewall, or it could be the tip of the spinner, um, or it could be some point in space five feet beyond the nose, or whatever the person who wrote the manual chose. The specific point's location was usually chosen to make the math easy. The problem for us is that it makes the CG locations uh, between airplanes or comparing those locations somewhat useless. For example, in the P-39 with its gear up, it's 134.22 inches aft of the datum. But for comparison purposes, that doesn't help us. It's also a useless number from an aircraft design standpoint. However, there is another way to reference CG, and that's as a percentage of the mean aerodynamic cord, or the MAC, which is how engineers do it, and it's how pilots typically do it in larger aircraft, and this is valid for plane-to-plane -plane comparisons. When the aircraft manuals for World War II fighters, uh, or I should say while those, while those manuals don't usually express CG in terms of percent of MAC, the various reports from NACA certainly do, as those guys are engineers, and that's the way they're looking at things. So we have a report on the P-39 showing they tested the plane in a range from 25.1 to 30.2% MAC. We also have a magazine article from the period which details CG information and shows that the plane loaded for combat with the gear up would have a CG of 26.3% MAC and a rearward CG with no ammunition for the fuselage guns of 28% MAC. Removing the guns moves it back to 34.5%, so I suspect that if you were going to fly a P-39 somewhere with no, no nose-mounted guns, uh, you'd put some ballast up there uh, for ferrying the airplane. Now, by normal civilian airplane standards, the P-39's typical combat CG of 26.3 is a bit aft, Normal civil type airplanes tend to hover in the low 20s. However, farther aft improves performance at the expense of some stability. So most World War II fighters, in fact all that I can find numbers for, had CGs pretty well aft of 20% MAC. 
For example, the Brewster Buffalo was 21.5 to 35.8. The numbers indicate the allowable range uh, for differing pilot weights, payload, uh, fuel loads, etc. NACA tested a Spitfire Mark V. They did not list the CG in terms of percent Mach, but they gave us the numbers we need to calculate it. You can check my math here, hopefully I'm right. They list the mean aerodynamic cord, the Mach, as 7 feet 1 inch, or 85 inches. They list the CG as being 31.1 inches aft of the leading edge of the wing, which I'm going to assume is at the root. They also say that the Mach is 4.8 inches aft of the leading edge at the wing root. So we subtract that 4.8 from 31.1, we get 26.3, which is how far aft the center of gravity is on the Mach. Divide that by 85 and we get 31% Mach. That's actually aft of the aft most combat CG for the P-39, probably part of why the Spitfire is so maneuverable. In the same, uh, correction, in, the, in a sample weight and balance problem in the B-24's pilot manual, they come up with a CG of 31.2, which is one of the only examples I could find of a World War II pilot manual showing a CG as a percent of Mach. The F-4U Corsair was tested. I know this is blurry, but it shows a range from 22.2 all the way out to 42, which is a huge range, but they were doing some unusual stuff in this test. Mid-20s to low 30s were the norm for the Corsair. The Thunderbolt was tested at forward CGs of 26% and a rear CG of 29. The P-51 was tested from about 21 to the low 30s, most of the testing as you see here in the 24 to 30 range. Here is a comparison chart showing typical combat CG ranges of various World War II aircraft. It's clear that the P-39 center of gravity was no more aft than typical World War II fighters. For comparison with modern airliners, I just want to throw this in, I'll point out that we normally aim for a 20% Mach as seen here on this Boeing. Now in check rides in the simulator, at least at the airline where I work, uh, they normally set it at 28%, which is a bit aft and it makes the plane a bit more unstable, but it's certainly within limits. I think what they're trying to do is keep the pilots really on their toes in training. So my greater point, though, is that even by modern airliner standards, the P-39CG is simply not that far aft. I mentioned earlier that the Aracobra's stall characteristics and recovery were pretty normal for a World War II fighter. They weren't great, but they were not bad. Now, spins were another matter. The plane did have somewhat unusual spin characteristics. However, the plane could be spun and recovered. Spins were not prohibited in the P-39 manual, but the manual did list them as not recommended. In other words, you can do it, but you, know, you might not want to. I really need to stress that there were many World War II fighters in which spins were prohibited, including the P-40, Hawker Tempest, certain versions of the Hawker Hurricane. So even if the P-39 couldn't be spun at all, that wouldn't be a deal breaker. But the fact is, it could be spun and recovered. While in a spin, the P-39 would oscillate in pitch, and if in a spin to the left, the gyroscopic forces of the propeller would try to bring the nose up, making recovery more difficult. It could still be done, but it wasn't as easy uh, as a spin to the right or spins in a more conventional airplane. The weight in the nose, which usually meant ammunition load, had a big effect here as well, and more is better. A sort of worst-case scenario for a P-39 would be a spin to the left with power on and no ammunition or ballast in the nose. That could lead to a flat spin if not handled properly. The spin recovery procedure was a little different than other airplanes, not much, just a bit. In general, spin recovery involves three phases, stopping the rotation, breaking the stall, and then flying out of the resulting dive. Here it is from the P-39Q manual, a later model. The first thing is pull the throttle back to idle and the prop to low pitch. That's pretty standard, but I think it's a bigger deal in the P-39 than some other airplanes. That low polar moment of inertia from the mid-engine design, which we talked about earlier, makes the plane more responsive for the pilot in pitch, but it also makes it easier for the gyroscopic forces of the propeller to pitch the nose up when it's in that left-hand turn spin, and we don't want that. Plus, there are some other factors at work here as well. So getting the throttle to idle, super important. Full opposite rudder when the spin is at the slowest. 
Well, full opposite rudder is pretty normal for spin recovery. Waiting until the spin is at its slowest isn't. While in a spin, the Aracobra oscillates quite a bit in pitch and rate of rotation. I'm interpreting this as saying that when it's spinning at, the, at its fastest point, the rudder may not have enough authority to stop it or slow it down enough for a recovery. When the rudder effect is noticeable, full forward stick and ailerons against the spin. Full, forward, full forward stick is a little unusual. Forward stick, of course, is normal. You have to do that to break the stall. Having to go full forward isn't exactly typical. It's not a problem. In most airplanes, you normally go forward until it breaks the stall, and if it happens to go full forward when it happens, uh, so be it. Ailerons against the spin, that's a bit unusual. Typical airplanes, uh, you'll hold the ailerons neutral during spin recovery. But this is actually good because it's what the pilot will tend to do naturally. In many airplanes, this will make the spin worse, but apparently not in the P-39, and I'm pretty sure that's because the washout in it is pretty aggressive and it keeps the ailerons functioning in a deep stall and even in a spin. So that's a, that's a plus. Now the remark about wing ammunition is there because in an earlier manual for the P-39, it had you move the stick in one direction when below a certain amount of wing ammunition and the other direction when above it. I don't know how the pilot was supposed to manage that during the heat of action, but it's what the manual said. But they cleaned the procedure up in this manual, uh, probably because testing showed that moving the ailerons against the spin always worked. I suspect that, again, that's because of the wing twist or washout in the wings, which kept the ailerons working properly even at very high angles of attack. If you follow the procedure, the plane will recover from the spin. There are two more notes, though. One reinforces the earlier problem, or the earlier point, I should say, about using the rudder when the rotation is at its slowest. And on the next page, it says in no uncertain terms that if the procedure is followed, the plane will recover in a half turn, which is pretty good. If the procedure is not followed, the plane may not recover. Bell Aircraft did thousands of spins when testing the P-39. And the U.S. military did quite a bit of testing as well. Bell lost one airplane in the testing, which isn't bad considering they were doing some pretty wild stuff with it. Normal spins, inverted spins... They were trying to aggravate the spins with odd entries and misuse of power and weird control inputs uh, to try and find the best ways to recover. The one airplane that crashed in the spin pancaked into the ground. It stayed together surprisingly well. The pilot did bail out successfully. This is the actual wreckage. Today, if that wreckage was found, somebody would rebuild that entire airplane around the data plate. Interestingly, according to Bob Hoover, who's a famous test pilot and also a very famous airshow pilot, According to Hoover, the plane could be recovered from a flat spin through the use of flaps and landing gear. Remember, putting the gear down moves the center of gravity forward a bit. Uh, so that was one of the things he would do to get the plane out of a flat spin. Hoover also claimed that he did what we now call a Lumpschewak in a P-39, also in a P-40. That's pretty wild. If you don't know what a Lumpschewak is, I'll put a link in the description. It's a 30-second video. Just watch the whole thing. Uh, you'll see it's pretty wild. Uh, and it's really wild when you consider that uh, somebody may have done that in World War II fighters. Moving on, um, it's a myth that the mid-engine layout led to bad flying characteristics or unrecoverable stalls or spins. In most ways, the Aracobra was pretty typical um, as compared with other fighters of the day. Only the spin recovery was a little bit different, but not too different. And in any case, it could be spun and recovered which is more than could be said of some of the other fighters of the period. The last myth I want to talk about is the one about the P-39 having vibration problems related to the drive shaft for the propeller. This never happened, but during the war there were misconceptions about this. Back to this magazine and this article by Robert J. Woods, Chief Design Engineer at Bell. He talks about the fact that the P-39 did have a drive shaft vibration during development, but it had nothing to do with the drive shaft that drove the propeller. It was an accessory drive shaft used in a new version of the Allison V1710. The problem was solved and solved quickly with no real drama. However, due to the limitations in the terminology of the period, people thought that this relatively minor accessory drive shaft uh, vibration was being caused by the drive shaft that drove the propeller. 
This had an adverse effect on the P-39's reputation, as explained by Mr. Woods in this article. So let's go back to this magazine for a moment. This was the first public article to discuss the P-39. Now some of our viewers here may have knowledge of magazine advertising or advertising in general. Probably a lot of you have a lot more knowledge about that than I do. So if, if you do, feel free to chime in in the comments section because I could be way off base here. It seems to me that if you're running an ad in a magazine, or as in this case, um, if there's an article on your product in a magazine, you are probably at least somewhat concerned with what things are on the adjacent pages. This was the adjacent article to the first article about the P-39 published in this magazine. Regardless of the reasoning, we know that there was a perception that the P-39's propeller drive shaft caused vibration, but that was never the case. The P-39's performance was held back though, especially at high altitude due to the lack of two-stage supercharging and the lack of intercooling. Removing that intercooled supercharger really cut its high altitude performance. And regarding aerodynamics, the plane was just designed a little too late to take advantage of that late, later uh, low drag information from NACA including the new low drag wings, such as the design seen on the P-51 Mustang. And in spite of the mid-engine configuration, visibility really wasn't that great. It was pretty good forward and forward and down, but the plane was designed before the bubble top canopy started to show up, and the plane's canopy framing and cockpit doors block the visibility to a pretty good extent to the side, and the huge intake scoop on top of the fuselage interferes a bit with visibility to the rear. Now it's not bad by 1938 standards, but by say 1942-1943 standards, yeah, the visibility out of the Air Cobra is not so great. Now none of this was lost on Bell Aircraft, and they did indeed come out with an updated Air Cobra, which took advantage of multi-stage gear-driven supercharging and incorporated the latest low drag wing from NACA. This became the Bell P-63 King Cobra, which is a story for another time. The P-39 Era Cobra's performance was decent. It's not as bad as people tend to think, but it wasn't great. It was a lot like the P-40. Now, had the Flying Tigers been flying P-39s, we would probably be talking about Era Cobras a lot more today. In the U.S., the Era Cobra was overshadowed by the superior performing Thunderbolts, Corsairs, Mustangs, and other later designs. However, flown by the Soviets, the Era Cobras made a good accounting of themselves. So good, in fact, that Bell Aircraft sent a group of representatives to the Soviet Union during the war to see what was going on over there. And I have that report, and if I make another video on the P-39, I'll go over it in detail, as well as comparative performance of the plane and its contemporaries. I want to thank my Patreon supporters who got early access to this and other videos. All the documents used in the creation of this video, including pilot manuals and the magazines I referenced, can be found in the Patreon section. Thanks to everyone for watching. Goodbye, and have a great day.